I met her in November, and we've pretty much been inseparable since. You know, it was her last night in town, so we met up with my boss at the hotel bar, and just got pretty much obliterated from there. In March 2014, Emily Lambert and her boyfriend, Robert Early, set off on what was supposed to be a fun and relaxing weekend getaway. They traveled to Carlsbad, New Mexico, hoping to spend quality time together and escape the pressures of daily life. Emily, a 30-year-old school teacher and mother of two, was excited for the trip, looking forward to unwinding and enjoying the scenic surroundings of New Mexico. Robert, her boyfriend at the time, had planned the trip as a way for them to reconnect and strengthen their relationship. Upon arriving in Carlsbad, the couple checked into a local hotel where they planned to stay for the duration of their weekend. Everything seemed to be going smoothly. They spent the day settling in, exploring a bit of the town, and preparing for a relaxing evening out. As night fell, the couple decided to visit a nearby bar, eager to enjoy the local nightlife and share some drinks together. At the bar, Emily and Robert appeared to be having a good time. They were seen drinking and socializing, and on the surface everything seemed normal. The couple was laughing and interacting with others, and there was no sign of any tension or problems between them. For onlookers, it looked like they were just another couple enjoying their evening out, making the most of their weekend away. By the way, I post true crime and strange cases here every day. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. However, as the night progressed, things began to take a turn. What started as a peaceful evening gradually shifted into something much darker. After leaving the bar and returning to their hotel, Emily and Robert got into an argument. The reasons for the argument remain unclear, but tensions between the two quickly escalated. What had been a pleasant evening together suddenly turned into a heated confrontation. Robert, fueled by alcohol and anger, lost control. In a fit of rage, he assaulted Emily. The situation quickly spiraled into violence as Robert attacked her, physically lashing out in a moment of uncontrollable fury. What began as an argument tragically ended with Emily being severely beaten. The violence was swift and brutal, leaving Emily defenseless and in grave danger. This was the moment when a weekend getaway, intended to bring them closer, transformed into a nightmare. What should have been a peaceful escape from their everyday lives became a moment of unimaginable violence. Emily, the loving mother and dedicated teacher, found herself caught in a deadly situation. The argument and subsequent violence would mark the tragic turning point in Emily Lambert's life. While the details of their fight might never be fully understood, what followed would leave a lasting impact not only on Emily's family but also on the community that knew her as a kind and caring person. This dark chapter of the weekend trip marked the beginning of a heartbreaking sequence of events, a tragedy that no one could have foreseen when Emily and Robert first set off for their weekend in New Mexico. The violence that unfolded in that hotel room would ultimately lead to devastating consequences. After the heated argument in their hotel room, the situation took a horrifying turn. In a moment of uncontrollable rage, Robert Early struck Emily Lambert with such force that she was knocked unconscious. What had started as a simple disagreement had quickly escalated into an act of brutal violence. Emily, a 30-year-old mother of two, lay unconscious, completely vulnerable and defenseless against Robert's growing aggression. Said instead of seeking help or stopping to consider the consequences of his actions, Robert made an unthinkable decision. He dragged Emily's limp body out of the hotel and placed her into his car. His mind was clouded by rage, and instead of calming down, his anger only intensified. Determined to continue the assault, Robert drove Emily to a remote area far away from the safety of the town and any chance of rescue. This isolated location would soon become the scene of a horrific crime. Once at the remote location, Robert's violent behavior escalated even further. He was no longer content with what had already happened. His anger drove him to continue the attack. Robert began to viciously assault Emily once more, even though she was already unconscious and incapable of defending herself. The violence he unleashed on her was relentless and merciless. In a chilling act of brutality, Robert tied Emily to the back of his car. What followed was an unimaginably cruel act that would ultimately lead to her death. Robert started the car and began to drive, dragging Emily's body behind it across the rough terrain. The physical damage inflicted upon her was immense. Each moment of the assault was filled with horror as Emily's life slipped away in this unspeakable act of violence. The viciousness of Robert's actions left no chance for Emily to survive. The combination of the earlier assault and the brutal killing in this remote location made sure of that. 
What had started as a weekend trip meant for relaxation had now ended in a senseless and devastating murder. By the time Robert had finished his horrifying act, Emily Lambert was no longer alive. Her body, brutalized and beaten, was left as a tragic testament to the horrific violence she had endured. This wasn't just a case of a momentary loss of control, it was a deliberate and brutal killing that had taken away the life of a young mother and teacher who had so much more to live for. Emily's tragic end in the remote area, at the hands of someone she trusted, sent shockwaves through her family, her community, and all who knew her. The brutality of her murder was almost impossible to comprehend, and the senselessness of it all made it even more devastating. What should have been a weekend filled with joy and togetherness had instead turned into a nightmare that no one could have ever predicted. The investigation into Emily Lambert's disappearance began the day after her brutal murder. Robert Early, her boyfriend and the one responsible for her death, initially reported her missing. He went to the police claiming that he had no idea where Emily had gone. According to his version of events, they had been enjoying their weekend together in Carlsbad, New Mexico, but at some point she had mysteriously disappeared. Robert's story suggested that perhaps Emily had wandered off her law left of her own accord, leaving him behind without any explanation. At first, his report was taken seriously, and authorities began searching for Emily. Given that she was a mother of two and a responsible, well-loved school teacher, her disappearance was alarming. However, as the police delved deeper into Robert's story, things didn't quite add up. His account of what had happened seemed incomplete, and there were gaps that raised suspicions. The police began investigating the couple's movements before Emily went missing, starting with the hotel where they had stayed. They gathered evidence from the hotel room, hoping to find some clues about what had really happened that night. The authorities also reviewed surveillance footage from the bar where Emily and Robert had spent the evening. This footage showed the couple together, appearing to enjoy their night. But what followed when they returned to the hotel was crucial to the investigation. As police examined Robert's story more closely, they noticed inconsistencies. The timeline he provided didn't quite match the evidence they had gathered. The surveillance footage and the physical evidence from the hotel painted a different picture from the one Robert was trying to present. The more the authorities pressed him, the more his story started to unravel. The inconsistencies in Robert's account made him a prime suspect in Emily's disappearance. Detectives began to suspect that something far more sinister had occurred and Robert's behavior during questioning only deepened their suspicions. He seemed evasive, struggling to explain the gaps in his story, and his explanations grew weaker under pressure. With mounting evidence and growing suspicion, the authorities intensified their questioning. They focused on breaking down Robert's version of events and confronting him with the contradictions they had uncovered. Under the weight of the investigation and the pressure of intense interrogation, Robert finally cracked. After hours of questioning, Robert early confessed to the murder of Emily Lambert. He admitted that they had gotten into a heated argument after returning to the hotel, and that, in a fit of rage, he had assaulted her. His confession revealed the full extent of the brutal crime. He admitted to knocking Emily unconscious, driving her to a remote location, and then continuing the assault in a horrifying manner. Robert's admission to tying her to the back of his car and dragging her to death shocked investigators and painted a devastating picture of Emily's final moments. So Robert's confession brought the investigation to a close, but it couldn't undo the tragedy that had unfolded. Emily Lambert's life had been taken in a senseless act of violence, and while justice would eventually be served, her family and community were left to grapple with the immense loss of a kind, loving woman. The aftermath of Emily Lambert's tragic death was marked by the pursuit of justice for her brutal murder. Once Robert Early had confessed to the crime, he was swiftly arrested and charged with murder. His admission of guilt left no room for doubt about what had happened, and the case quickly moved toward trial. The evidence gathered by the police, along with Robert's detailed confession, painted a clear and horrifying picture of the events leading to Emily's death. During the trial, the court heard how a simple argument between the couple had spiraled into unimaginable violence. Robert's actions were described in detail, and the brutality of the crime shocked everyone in attendance. Emily's family, including her two young children, had to endure the painful process of hearing about the circumstances of her death. The grief they felt was overwhelming, and the trial only served as a grim reminder of the loss they had suffered. The case against Robert early was strong, and the outcome was inevitable. In the end, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of perishing. The severity of the sentence reflected the heinous nature of the crime. The court recognized the deliberate and cruel way in which Robert had taken Emily's life, and he was punished accordingly. 
For Emily's loved ones, the sentence provided some measure of justice, though it could never truly ease the pain of losing her. The impact of Emily's murder extended far beyond the courtroom. Her family was left devastated, especially her two children, who had now lost their mother in such a violent and tragic way. Emily had been a loving and dedicated mother, and her sudden death left a void in their lives that could never be filled. The emotional toll on her family, particularly her children, was profound. They would grow up without their mother, and the trauma of her loss would be something they carried with them for the rest of their lives. Emily's death also raised awareness about the dangers of domestic violence and relationship abuse. Her case became a heartbreaking example of how quickly things can turn deadly when violence erupts in a relationship. It highlighted the importance of recognizing the warning signs of abuse and the need for support systems for victims who may feel trapped or unsafe. Many people who heard about Emily's story were reminded of the importance of addressing these issues before they escalate into tragedy. In the wake of Emily's murder, her friends, family, and community came together to honor her memory. Vigils were held, and tributes poured in for the woman who had been taken from them far too soon. Emily's kindness, dedication to her students, and love for her children were remembered by all who knew her. While her life had been cut short, her legacy lived on through the awareness raised about domestic violence and the ongoing efforts to prevent others from experiencing similar fates. Though justice had been served with Robert Early's life sentence, the emotional scars left behind by Emily's murder would last forever. Her family, friends, and community continued to mourn the loss of a woman whose bright future was tragically stolen away in an act of senseless violence. Emily Lambert's tragic case did more than just shock her family and community, it shined a light on the critical issue of domestic violence. Her story became a powerful example of how quickly an abusive relationship can turn fatal and underscored the importance of recognizing the early signs of abusive behavior. Emily's death raised awareness about the dangers that can lurk behind the seemingly normal relationships, prompting many to have important discussions about the warning signs of abuse and the need for prevention. The fact that Emily's relationship with Robert Early had seemed ordinary to those around them made the case even more impactful. It served as a chilling reminder that abuse can sometimes remain hidden until it's too late. Emily's friends, family, and even the community at large began to reflect on the signs that might have been missed, and it became clear that more needed to be done to prevent similar tragedies from happening in the future. One of the most significant legacies of Emily's case was the way it sparked conversations about domestic violence, not only in her low community, but across the country. People began talking openly about the importance of recognizing abusive behaviors early on in a relationship, such as extreme jealousy, controlling behavior, emotional manipulation, or sudden bursts of anger, and how to take action before these patterns escalate. Emily's story became a point of reference for those who were suffering in silence or knew someone who might be at risk. It encouraged people to speak up and seek help, knowing that staying silent could lead to dangerous outcomes. Emily's family and friends, determined to turn their grief into something positive, started memorial efforts in her honor. They wanted her life and story to serve as a reminder of the importance of addressing domestic violence and advocating for victims. Vigils were held in her memory, where her loved ones shared stories about the kind and loving person Emily was. These events weren't just about mourning the loss of Emily, they were also about raising awareness and supporting those affected by abuse. In addition to the vigils, other efforts were made to keep Emily's memory alive. Educational campaigns were launched in her name, focusing on educating people about the signs of abusive relationships and how to intervene safely. Her family, heartbroken by her loss, wanted to make sure that no one else had to suffer the same fate. They spoke out about the importance of domestic violence awareness and the need for more resources for those trapped in abusive situations. Emily's legacy grew into a symbol of the fight against domestic violence. While her life had been tragically cut short, her story became a powerful tool in spreading awareness and inspiring action. Her case encouraged victims to seek help and reminded communities of their role in supporting those in abusive situations. Emily Lambert's name became associated with hope, resilience, and the ongoing effort to prevent domestic violence. Though her life ended in tragedy, her legacy continues to impact lives and bring attention to a crucial issue that affects so many. Emily Lambert's story is one of heartbreak and tragedy but it's also a stark reminder of the dangers that can exist in relationships, even those that seem normal on the surface. Her life, which was filled with love, dedication, and hope, was cruelly taken in an act of senseless violence. As a mother, a teacher, and a caring person, Emily touched many lives, and her loss was deeply felt by her children, family, and community. While her story ended in devastating violence, Emily's legacy has had a lasting impact. 
Her case raised awareness about the very real dangers of domestic violence and the importance of recognizing early warning signs before things spiral out of control. It prompted crucial conversations about the nature of abusive relationships and the need for stronger support systems for victims. The efforts of her family and friends to honor her memory have turned her story into a symbol of hope for those struggling in silence. Emily's death was a tragedy, but her legacy continues to inspire change. Her story reminds us that we all have a role to play in preventing domestic violence, whether it's through offering support to those in need, educating ourselves and others about the signs of abuse, or advocating for stronger protections for victims. Though Emily is no longer with us, her story lives on serving as a call to action for communities to come together and ensure that no one else suffers the way she did. In closing, Emily Lambert's life was marked by kindness and care, but her death has become a powerful symbol in the fight against domestic violence. Of her story urges us to remember the importance of awareness, intervention, and support for those in dangerous situations. By continuing to honor her memory, we can help prevent future tragedies and ensure that Emily's legacy lives on, making a difference in the lives of others. Hi everyone, my name is Sunny, and today we're diving into a heartbreaking case. Julia Simmons had been living with Stephen Nicholas, a divorce day trader, in his three-bedroom house just outside of Portland, Oregon. Julia explained that she and Stephen initially met online while she was searching for a rental. At first, Stephen came across as kind and charming, which made Julia comfortable sharing a home with him. While the two were living together, Stephen met Julia's daughter, Rhonda, who was 20 years old at the time. Stephen, who was 10 years older than her, found Rhonda irresistible. Her beauty captivated him, but what really drew him in was her amazing personality. To Stephen's surprise, Rhonda also seemed to develop feelings for him, and before long, the two started dating. Their relationship quickly became more serious. Eventually, Rhonda moved out of her mother's place and settled into Stephen's condo. During this time, Stephen also grew close to Rhonda's family, especially her younger sisters, Melanie and Tessa. When Stephen and Rhonda began dating, Tessa was only nine years old. She loved spending time with Stephen, who she thought was fun and playful, often treating him more like a friend than an adult. Over the years, Rhonda and Stephen stayed together, becoming a committed couple, though they never officially married. This was something Rhonda often thought about. Her close friends knew how much she wanted to get married, and they believed she was holding on to hope that Stephen would propose. Stephen always assured her that they would get married, claiming it would happen in the summer of 2009, according to his schedule. Though marriage eluded them, the couple did have a daughter together. Becoming a mother transformed Rhonda's life. Her little girl quickly became the center of her world, and Rhonda cherished every moment she spent with her. So even though being a mom brought her immense joy, Rhonda also felt a longing to return to her modeling career. However, according to Stephen, after giving birth, Rhonda struggled with her self-image. He said she became the heaviest she'd ever been and that it made her feel unattractive. To help her regain her confidence, they decided to hike the top 25 trails in Oregon as a way to lose weight and bond. Stephen claimed their relationship was doing better than ever during this time. They rarely argued, and he felt that their bond had grown stronger. But Rhonda's friends painted a much darker picture. She had confided in them about Stephen's abusive behavior. On one occasion, Rhonda even took photos of bruises on her back, using a mirror, documenting injuries she said were caused by a fight with Stephen. By the way, I post true crime and strange cases here every day. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. On March 16, 2009, Stephen and Rhonda, who was 23 years old at the time, went hiking on the Eagle Creek Trail. As they walked along the path, Rhonda snapped a photo of Stephen with her phone. Before leaving for the hike, she had sent her mom a text, joking, he's either going to give me a succumbs cliff, ha ha ha. At first, the weather was perfect and the two enjoyed their time outdoors, but Stephen later claimed that Rhonda began acting strangely during the hike. He said she asked him what would happen if something ever happened to her and whether he would take care of their daughter. Stephen reassured her that he would. As clouds started to gather and the weather took a turn for the worse, Stephen suggested they head back. But instead of returning, Stephen said Rhonda suddenly wrapped a towel around her shoulders, declaring herself Supergirl. She then started running down the narrow, slippery trail. According to Stephen, he watched in horror as Rhonda lost her footing and fell off the side of the trail, plunging 150 feet into the ravine below. Desperate to help her, Stephen said he climbed down to the spot where she had landed. He tried to call 911, but he had no cell service. With no way to get help, Stephen claimed he had no choice but to leave Rhonda behind and hike back to the trailhead to call for help. 
Later that day, rescue workers arrived and recovered Rhonda's body from the ravine. So ever, Rhonda's family became suspicious of Stephen's behavior. They noticed that he didn't seem to show much emotion during her memorial service, which raised doubts about how he truly felt. But Stephen insisted this wasn't true. He claimed he was devastated and cried constantly. He explained that when he feels deep sadness, he tends to isolate himself and prefers to be alone. Not long after Rhonda's death, Stephen packed up his belongings and moved across Oregon to be closer to his family, taking his daughter with him. So this sudden move only fueled Rhonda's family's suspicions. They couldn't help but wonder what really happened between Stephen and Rhonda during those final moments on the trail. Then, in 2006, Stephen made an unexpected decision. He relocated to China, bringing his daughter along. They settled in Wuxi, a city located about 75 miles from Shanghai. Stephen had previously lived in China during his first marriage and had grown fond of the culture and the people there. This new chapter in Stephen's life only deepened the mystery surrounding what happened to Rhonda on that fateful day. So while living in China, Stephen found work teaching English to Chinese business professionals. So daughter Rhonda quickly adjusted to her new surroundings. Within just two months of moving, she had already become fluent in Mandarin. Both Stephen and his daughter seemed to thrive in their new life abroad. During his time in China, Stephen met a woman named Landy Yin Yan, and the two fell in love. Landy built a strong relationship with Stephen's daughter, stepping in as a mother figure. Stephen appreciated the love and care Landy gave his daughter, embracing her new role with open arms. After dating for a year, Stephen decided to propose to Landy, and to his delight, she accepted. In February 2015, Stephen and his daughter flew back to the United States, preparing for their wedding. The couple planned to have two ceremonies, one in the U.S. and one in China, to celebrate with both of their families and friends. Stephen and his daughter landed in San Francisco, arriving one day before Landy's flight. However, as they disembarked from the plane in San Francisco to catch their connecting flight to Oregon, things took a strange turn. An officer approached Stephen, telling him there was an issue with his luggage. Stephen had no idea that this routine encounter would spiral into a life-altering event. Within minutes, police officers arrived and separated Stephen from his daughter. What Stephen didn't realize was that, all along, detectives had been quietly investigating Rhonda's death. Suspicious details surrounding her fall from Eagle Creek Trail had kept the investigation alive for years. So behind the scenes, Rhonda's mother had played a crucial role in keeping the case open. She persistently contacted detectives, demanding updates and urging them not to let her daughter's death go unresolved. As a result, detectives eventually reached a conclusion Stephen was responsible for Rhonda's death. So at the San Francisco airport, Stephen was arrested for murder and extradited to Oregon to face charges. Stephen later claimed he felt like he was dreaming. He hoped that, at any moment, he would wake up in China, safe and sound with Landy by his side. But this was no nightmare, this was reality. Initially, Stephen's bail was set at $2 million, leaving him stuck in jail for 14 months as he awaited trial. Eventually, a judge lowered his bail to $250,000, and Stephen's attorney was able to secure his release with a bond. Once out of jail, Stephen was fitted with an ankle monitor, restricting his movements while he awaited trial. When Rhonda's family heard about Stephen's arrest, they were overwhelmed with relief. Her mother, in particular, couldn't hold back her emotions and burst into tears upon learning the news. After years of heartbreak, the family finally felt that justice for Rhonda was within reach. Following Stephen's release on bail, his defense team went to work. His attorney and investigators visited the Eagle Creek Trail, determined to prove that Rhonda's fall had been a tragic accident, not foul play. They aimed to convince the court that Stephen had not pushed her and that her death was purely accidental. Stephen's attorney emphasized that the Eagle Creek Trail is one of the most popular hiking spots in the Columbia River Gorge, known for its scenic beauty and challenging paths. During the hearings, the medical examiner who had performed Rhonda's autopsy provided key findings, so the examiner revealed that all of Rhonda's injuries were located below her waist, a crucial piece of information for the defense. Using this discovery, Stephen's lawyers argued that Rhonda had fallen feet first, which aligned with the theory that her death was an accident. They claimed that had she been pushed, her body would have tumbled head over heels, leading to injuries on other parts of her body. The defense also introduced evidence from Rhonda's therapy sessions. While these notes confirmed that Rhonda struggled with depression, they made no mention of suicidal thoughts. However, Rhonda had described her relationship with Stephen as loveless, a fact the defense used to support their argument that she may have taken her own life. 
Stephen's legal team suggested that Rhonda's depression, combined with dissatisfaction in her relationship, could have led her to end her own life on the trail. They hoped to cast doubt on the prosecution's theory that Stephen had deliberately pushed Rhonda, causing her fatal injuries. Stephen further claimed that Rhonda had battled depression long before they met. He alleged that she had tried to take her own life on multiple occasions. However, Rhonda's family strongly denied these allegations, accusing Stephen of lying to shift the blame away from himself. They were convinced that Stephen was trying to protect himself by falsely portraying Rhonda as suicidal. D. Stephen also asserted that Rhonda had struggled with substance abuse from a young age, experimenting with drugs since she was 12 years old. So the medical examiner's report contradicted this claim. It found only trace amounts of marijuana in her system, along with prescription medications she had been taking to manage anxiety and postpartum depression. As the hearings continued, more unsettling evidence emerged, further complicating the case. So disturbing revelations shed new light on Stephen's involvement in Rhonda's tragic death, leaving everyone wondering what truly happened that day on the Eagle Creek Trail. It was discovered that Stephen had been involved in a romantic relationship with Rhonda's younger sister, Melanie, who was only 16 years old at the time. This revelation shocked everyone, as Stephen was in his 30s, and Melanie was still a minor. The prosecution argued that this illicit relationship could have given Stephen a motive to kill Rhonda. Once Rhonda found out about the affair, tensions grew between the couple, possibly driving Stephen to murder her to cover up his actions. After Stephen's arrest for Rhonda's death, he was also indicted on two counts of third-degree sexual assault and three counts of third-degree sodomy, all related to his involvement with Melanie Casto, Rhonda's sister. While awaiting trial for Rhonda's murder, Stephen pleaded guilty in 2005 to two counts of sexual abuse. In a signed statement, he admitted, I had sexual intercourse with Melanie Casto twice. However, Stephen later claimed that this confession wasn't true and said he was pressured into signing it. He insisted that the only reason he took the plea deal was to avoid legal complications, hoping to fight for custody of his daughter. According to him, he was desperate to get his daughter back. The prosecution, however, painted a different picture. They argued that Stephen's relationship with Melanie had lasted over four years. He later confessed in court that he did, in fact, have a sexual relationship with Rhonda's teenage sister. One piece of evidence presented was a text message from Rhonda to Melanie, sent just before the tragic hike at Eagle Creek. In the message, Rhonda called Stephen a piece of garbage and accused him of manipulating Melanie to hurt her emotionally. Rhonda's mother testified that her daughter knew Stephen was trying to create conflict between her and Melanie. Despite this, Rhonda deeply loved her little sister and wanted to repair their relationship. The state also revealed troubling details about Stephen's past. Just six months after Rhonda's death, Stephen was arrested and charged with five counts of sexual abuse this time for allegedly touching a 13-year-old girl. Stephen denied the accusations, but later admitted to sending the girl a sexually suggestive ball sex message along with a picture of himself without a shirt up. Acknowledging the inappropriate nature of his actions, Stephen pleaded guilty to one count of sexual harassment. During a preliminary hearing, the prosecution introduced photos Rhonda had taken of herself to document bruises on her back, which she said came from fights with Stephen. Rhonda's best friend also testified, saying she had overheard multiple arguments between the couple during phone calls with Rhonda. The court further heard testimony from Stephen's ex-wife, who claimed he had once tried to suffocate her and attempted to push her over the railing of their apartment building's fourth floor back in 2003. However, Stephen was never charged for that incident and denied the accusations. Rhonda's family remained convinced that Stephen had murdered her, suspecting that his motive was financial. They claimed that Stephen had taken out a life insurance policy on Rhonda and had recently increased the coverage. Rhonda's mother was certain that Stephen, who had lost a significant amount of money through day trading the previous year, saw the policy payout as a way to solve his financial troubles. Friends and family also testified that Rhonda adored her nine-month-old daughter, and it was unthinkable that she would take her own life by jumping off the Eagle Creek Trail. In May 2017, Rhonda's family was devastated to learn that the state had reached a plea agreement with Stephen. Despite believing that Stephen had intentionally killed the Rhonda, the prosecution knew their case was weak due to the lack of physical evidence proving that he had pushed her from the trail. Stephen pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of criminally negligent homicide. He was credited with time served while waiting trial, but he had to remain on parole for three years. Stephen's ankle monitor was removed, and he was released from custody. However, Rhonda's family felt betrayed. They believed Stephen should have faced harsher punishment for what he had done. 
During the sentencing hearing, Rhonda's sister gave a powerful impact statement. She expressed her anger, telling Stephen that he had destroyed their family and caused them immense pain and grief. Rhonda's mother also shared her confusion and frustration, saying she couldn't understand how Stephen could have taken her daughter's life and left their family shattered. Stephen, however, maintained that he did not push Rhonda off the cliff. He claimed that he only accepted the plea deal because he needed to secure custody of his daughter, fearing he would run out of time to do so if he fought the charges. Despite his statements, Rhonda's family and friends never believed his version of events. In 2018, Stephen gave a shocking interview where he made disturbing comments about what happened on the day of Rhonda's death. He revealed that when he reached Rhonda after her fall, she was still alive. When asked if he had ended her suffering, Stephen responded with a chilling hypothetical. If you see your war buddy in pain and shoot him to end his suffering, is that murder? She suggested that taking such an action might be considered justified, even though it's still technically homicide. Although Stephen never explicitly confessed to harming Rhonda, his words hinted at a more sinister involvement in her death than he had previously admitted. Later in 2017, Rhonda's mother applied for Social Security survivor benefits on behalf of Rhonda's daughter. She claimed the child had been living with her, and she promised to use the money solely for the baby's care. However, the state accused her of fraud, alleging that the child had actually been living with Stephen between 2010 and 2014. The state charged Rhonda's mother with theft of government funds, claiming she had unlawfully collected nearly $40,000 in benefits over five years. Her defense team argued that her actions were motivated by a desire to protect her granddaughter from Stephen, fearing he would exploit the $1 million life insurance policy taken out on Rhonda's life. They also emphasized that Rhonda's mother had struggled with depression, which had worsened after her daughter's tragic death. The state argued that between April 2010 and December 2014, when Rhonda's mother claimed that her granddaughter had been living with her, the child was actually living with her father, Stephen. As a result, the state charged Rhonda's mother with theft of government funds, accusing her of illegally collecting nearly $40,000 in benefits over five years. In her defense, Rhonda's mother's attorneys explained that her actions were driven by a desperate attempt to prevent Stephen from gaining custody of the child. They claimed she was afraid Stephen would exploit the $1 million life insurance policy he had taken out on Rhonda. The defense argued that Rhonda's mother's primary concern was protecting her granddaughter from being used for financial gain. The attorneys also revealed that Rhonda's mother had struggled with depression, which worsened significantly after her daughter's death. To cope with her grief, she began using marijuana as a way to self-medicate. The defense explained that her reliance on the drug clouded her judgment and impaired her ability to make sound decisions. At the age of 53, Rhonda's mother pleaded guilty to the theft charges. As part of her sentence, the judge ordered her to serve one month in a halfway house, followed by three years of probation. In addition, she was required to repay the stolen benefits, which amounted to $39,100. Meanwhile, Rhonda and Stephen's daughter had been placed in foster care after the Oregon Department of Human Services took custody of her in October 2015. This decision came after Stephen pleaded guilty to sexual abuse involving a 13-year-old girl, which led the Oregon court to terminate his parental rights. However, Stephen did not accept the ruling quietly. He appealed the court's decision, determined to fight for his parental rights and custody of his daughter. Hey everyone, today we're diving into a heart-wrenching story that shook an entire city. If you enjoy these kinds of deep dive crime cases, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss out on new uploads. Now, let's get into this disturbing case. In one of the most vibrant and lively cities, an unspeakable tragedy took place that stunned the entire community. It revolves around a young, driven woman named Ajan Yalova whose promising life was stolen in a brutal crime. This horrifying incident didn't just claim her life, it also revealed deep flaws in the system exposing issues like violence against women and police negligence. Her story left her family and friends devastated. To make matters worse, their cries for help were dismissed by the authorities when they needed them most. It was a double blow. They were not only mourning the loss of their beloved daughter and sister, but also struggling against a system that seemed indifferent to their plea for justice. I agent's friends spoke of her warmth and kindness, which made it even harder to understand how anyone could commit such a heartless act. 
Even after being caught and put behind bars, the criminal continued to provoke the public by posting unsettling content on social media. But before we dive into the dark twists of this case, let's start from the beginning. By the way, I post true crime and strange cases here every day. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. Ijon's story soon became a rallying cry for justice, a reminder of the importance of valuing life and protecting women. Her tragic end moved countless hearts and sparked a conversation about what needs to change to stop such horrors from happening again. In Almadi, a city known for its peaceful vibe, March 19, 2021, became a day no one would forget. That morning, the residents were stunned when human remains were discovered scattered in various parts of the city. The gruesome discoveries not only horrified the locals but also left a scar on the entire community. Shortly after, the family of 19-year-old Ayajan Yalova was forced to confront a devastating truth. They had to undergo DNA testing to confirm that these remains belonged to their missing loved one. Behind every joyful moment she shared was a hidden darkness, waiting to surface, and now, that darkness had spread through the city like wildfire. Just a day before her tragic death, on March 18, 2021, Ayajan seemed full of excitement for the future. She shared a new video on TikTok where she danced and laughed, radiating happiness. Her positive energy was infectious, and her followers could sense how much joy she felt in those moments. Ajan was someone who loved to connect with people and express her creativity online. She often posted snippets of her life, dreams, and plans which gave her followers a glimpse of the bright future she was working toward. At that time, she was particularly excited about launching her own brand, combining her love for design and fashion. However, not everything in Ajahn's life was as perfect as it seemed on social media. So behind the scenes, she had been exchanging messages with a stranger who eventually entered her life. At first, these conversations seemed harmless, even promising. But the person behind them had dark intentions, hiding his true motives. So as and dreamed a future in fashion, she didn't realize that danger was closing in on her. That same day, Ajahn attended her classes at the Academy of Design and Fashion where she was in her fourth year. Known for her dedication, she rarely missed a lecture. Even when her classmates would take a day off, Ajahn stayed focused, determined to make the most of her studies. So in the morning of March 18th, she was full of energy as she made her way to class, her mind filled with thoughts of a bright future in the fashion world. After finishing her classes, Ajahn headed to her part-time job at a nail salon where she worked as a manicurist. This job not only gave her some extra income but also allowed her to meet different people and develop new skills. She enjoyed the work because it gave her a sense of independence and allowed her to grow both personally and professionally. So Jan's passion for fashion had started when she was just a little girl sewing clothes for her dolls and making small gifts for her mom. Over the years, her love for creating beautiful things only grew stronger and now she was determined to turn that passion into a career. So, but as Ajin focused on her dreams, subtle but unsettling changes were beginning to unfold in the city. So there was a growing sense of unease among the locals, as if something sinister was lurking in the background. People started to wonder who might be the next victim of this invisible danger, which seemed to creep through the city without warning. On the night of March 20, 2021, the city of Almaty was gripped by fear. Ajan, who had always been responsible and punctual, suddenly vanished. Her family and friends noticed her absence right away and immediately grew worried. Ajan had never been the type to neglect her responsibilities, and her sudden disappearance didn't sit right with anyone. On the morning of March 19, after finishing her shift at the nail salon, Ajan felt satisfied with her day. She had met new people, made good connections, and felt like everything was going well. But somewhere between the end of her shift and her journey home, something went terribly wrong. Ajan lived in a dormitory not far from her academy and it was a place usually filled with laughter and chatter. But that night, as the dormitory doors were locked at 11 p.m., Ajan was nowhere to be found. Moro Bakarov, the dorm supervisor, later confirmed that Ajan had never stayed out late before or missed a night at the dorm. When her friends realized she wasn't back, they alerted Moro, and together they decided to contact the police. However, the response they got was shockingly dismissive. The officers brushed off their concerns, saying, wait it out, she'll come back when she's done having fun. Hours passed, and with no sign of Ajan, her family and Torgan began to lose hope. Even her boyfriend, who was usually in touch with her, had no idea where she could be. Desperate, her family reached out to the police again, urging them to take action and start searching. Ajan's older sister, who lived in Almaty, took it upon herself to file a missing persons report. She hoped that by involving the authorities they could find Ajan before it was too late. 
but with each passing hour the chances of finding her safe and sound grew slimmer. When Ajahn's sister tried to file a missing persons report, she was met with cold indifference. The police told her they were overwhelmed with managing protests in the city and suggested she wait. Frustrated but unwilling to give up, the family kept trying, hoping someone would take their concerns seriously. Unfortunately, they were met with the same lack of interest from the authorities. Realizing they were on their own, the family decided to seek help from local volunteers. Flyers with Ajin's picture were posted all over Almaty, and volunteers came together, determined to find her safe and sound. So they organized search parties and scoured the city, hoping every lead would bring them closer to Aijin. Looking back at the events leading to her disappearance, it becomes clear how much hope and ambition drove Ajahn. She had eagerly left her hometown of Taldikorgan to enroll at the Academy of Design and Fashion, where she dreamed of building a career. Alongside her studies, she pursued custom-made clothing and launched her own online store, introducing her brand called Aelon. So this business not only gave her financial independence, but also brought her a sense of fulfillment as she poured her creativity into every design. In recent months, her online store was thriving, and orders were coming in fast, filling her with joy. The success gave her even more motivation to expand her business into the Turkish market. Determined to make that happen, Ajan signed up for Turkish language classes. Even though learning a new language was tough, she pushed through every challenge with persistence. Her teachers admired her dedication and saw real potential in her, which only strengthened her resolve to succeed. There was a clear spark in her eyes she was ready to chase her dreams with everything she had. Each night after finishing her classes, Ajin would work a part-time job at a nail salon. Her shifts usually ended around 9 p.m., and she always made sure to leave her workstation spotless, believing that attention to detail would make her clients feel welcome. As she locked up for the night, she felt proud of her hard work, confident that she was moving closer to achieving her goals. But life had an unexpected and dark turn waiting just around the corner. By March 21, 2021, the search for Ajin had intensified. After multiple attempts from her family, the police finally formed a special investigation team to take on the case. The volunteers, who had been tirelessly searching day and night, found a key breakthrough. They tracked down a taxi driver who confirmed that he had given a ride to Ajan and a young man on the night of March 19th in the Net neighborhood. This crucial lead was immediately shared with the police, who wasted no time in obtaining footage from security cameras. The footage revealed Ajan entering the elevator of a high-rise building, accompanied by an unidentified man. This discovery reignited the hope that they could still find her alive. It didn't take long for the investigators to identify the man from the footage. They traced him to his apartment, which belonged to 28-year-old Rockman Barad Tarif. On the evening of March 21st, around 10 p.m., police officers arrived at his residence, hoping to find answers. Tarif was inside, but he refused to open the door, which immediately raised suspicions. After a brief conversation, the officers decided there was no time to waste. They forced their way inside. What greeted them was a scene straight out of a nightmare. Blood was everywhere, staining the walls and floors. But in the middle of the room, they found a dismembered body, pieces of a life shattered beyond recognition. Even the most experienced detectives accustomed to gruesome crime scenes were shaken to their core by the horrors inside that apartment. At first, Tarov wasn't found inside the main apartment space. He had hidden himself, trying to evade the police, hoping they would leave without him. When officers finally tracked him down, he attempted to take his own life. Thankfully, first responders arrived just in time to administer first aid, stabilizing him long enough to rush him to the hospital for emergency surgery. As doctors fought to save Tarov's life, the police got to work, collecting evidence from the apartment. They knew they had to piece together the full story behind what had happened to Ajan. So once Tarov's condition stabilized a few days later, he was transferred to a detention center. This move was critical to ensure his safety while the investigation continued without interference. Public interest in the case exploded, and the gruesome details sent shockwaves through the community. People demanded answers, and the pressure on the investigators to solve the case grew stronger by the day. The apartment where the crime had taken place was sealed off, and forensic experts began a detailed investigation, determined to leave no stone unturned. What they discovered inside the apartment was beyond disturbing. Even seasoned crime scene investigators were left speechless. At first glance, it was hard to believe that someone who seemed so ordinary could carry out such unimaginable acts of violence. But the evidence spoke volumes. Among the most chilling discoveries were a human scalp, extracted teeth and fingernails, all carefully stored in separate plastic bags. 
The meticulous way these items were kept made it seem as though they were nothing more than souvenirs, a terrifying glimpse into the mind of someone deeply disturbed. It was as if the apartment had been transformed into a macabre collection, straight out of a horror film. The nightmare didn't end there. Investigators also found dismembered body parts and a human skull inside the apartment. Medical examiners later confirmed that the victim's head had been boiled in water for hours, leaving only the skull behind. The scene was profoundly unsettling, and even the most experienced officers had to take a moment to process what they were seeing. The police officers struggled to maintain their composure as they worked through the gruesome evidence in Ajahn's case. Each discovery painted a more disturbing picture. Over the next few days, other parts of her body were found in dumpsters and abandoned basements across the city. So these horrific discoveries revealed the brutal extent of what had happened, leaving investigators scrambling to piece everything together. Ojan had gone missing on March 19th, and soon after her family received the devastating confirmation, the remains found around the city were hers. The nightmare had become a reality. During questioning, Tarov confessed to the events leading up to the horrific crime. He explained that he and Ajan had argued late that night, sometime around 11 p.m. In his version of events, he lost control in a moment of rage and killed her. Fearing arrest, he decided to dismember her body to make it harder for the authorities to trace the crime back to him. He spent the night spreading pieces of her remains across the city, as if erasing her existence could somehow erase his guilt. When asked if he had any connection to Ajan, Tarov denied knowing her personally, insisting it was a one-off encounter. This claim left Ajan's family confused and troubled. If this crime was just a panicked attempt to cover his tracks, why had he gone to the extreme lengths of pulling out her teeth, removing her nails, and stripping her skin? They couldn't understand why someone would commit such unspeakable acts without a deeper, more sinister reason. Ajahn's family also began to wonder was she his first victim, or could he have done this before? As the investigation unfolded, new information about Tara's background came to light. Investigators discovered that Tarov had once attended a medical academy, studying to become a pharmacist. However, he was expelled due to poor academic performance. This unsettling detail raised suspicions that his knowledge of anatomy might have been used for darker purposes. Some investigators speculated that the body parts found in his apartment might have been intended for medical or commercial use. The investigation deepened as detectives combed through Tarov's social media accounts and analyzed his interactions with other women. Fortunately, no other women were harmed, but this only made the case more mysterious why Ajan. As detectives dug further, they uncovered chat messages between Ajan and Tarov on a dating site. When this information was leaked online, rumors began to swirl. Some speculated that Ajan might have met him for financial reasons, sparking heated discussions among the public. However, friends and acquaintances quickly came to her defense, insisting she was not the type to get involved in questionable relationships. They described her as modest and careful in all her interactions with men. Ajahn's family also believed that Tarov had manipulated her, luring her to his apartment under false pretenses. Knowing how dedicated she was to her brand, they thought she might have gone to meet him believing he was a client interested in placing an order or taking measurements. They couldn't fathom how someone could set such a cruel trap for an innocent girl who was just trying to grow her business. Ajahn's roommate, who was one of the few people she confided in, later shared some unsettling information with investigators. Ajahn had recently told her that a man had expressed interest in buying her entire collection. While she had initially been excited, she felt uneasy about the man's offer, since she was always cautious Kao in dealing with strangers. Investigators suspected that Tarov used this business opportunity as a way to lure her to his apartment. At the center of this tragic story was Rachman Barad Tarov, who had contacted Ajahn through social media, claiming he needed clothing from her brand. Investigators concluded that this was likely a pre-planned trap that led to the devastating events that followed. The days leading up to Ajahn's funeral were filled with overwhelming grief for her family. The wait to recover her body was excruciating, with her loved ones desperate for closure. It wasn't until April 16, 2021, nearly a month after her disappearance, that her body was finally released for burial. She was laid to rest in her hometown of Taldikorgan, surrounded by family, friends, and those who had known her vibrant spirit. The atmosphere at the funeral was heavy with sorrow as people shared stories of her kindness and the light she brought into their lives. Meanwhile, the investigation faced several obstacles and rumors. Speculation about Aejon's personal life tarnished her reputation, with online discussions full of baseless accusation. However, the messages exchanged between her and Tarov 
which were uncovered during the investigation, proved that these accusations were unfounded. This fueled outrage among her supporters, who refused to believe that she had willingly put herself in harm's way. As for Tarov, his former teachers and classmates described him as quiet and reserved, someone who never caused trouble. Some even believed he was framed or misunderstood, making it difficult for them to accept the reality of his crimes. But the evidence was undeniable. Law enforcement conducted over 30 forensic examinations, compiling a massive case file that spanned 30 volumes. The investigation required an extraordinary amount of effort and time from the authorities. In the end, psychiatric evaluations confirmed that Terov was mentally sound at the time of the crime. He was fully aware of his actions and understood the consequences. The trial marked the final chapter of this horrific case. Ajan's family demanded the harshest punishment for Terov, along with financial compensation for emotional damages tolling 26 billion tenge. After reviewing all the evidence, the court sentenced Terov to 25 years in prison. However, the judge stopped short of imposing a life sentence, citing the legal limitations of the case. The court granted the family a civil compensation of 20 million tenge. While this small amount could never heal their wounds, it provided some financial relief during their difficult ordeal. For Ajahn Yalova's relatives, the tragedy was not just about loss but also the deep frustration and anger they felt toward the police. They vividly recalled that heartbreaking day when they first went to the police station, desperately asking for help. They were filled with fear, pleading with law enforcement to start searching immediately. But instead of finding support, they were met with indifference. The officers dismissed their concerns and brushed them aside. This cold response from the police became an unbearable weight that haunted the family, intensifying their fear with every passing hour. As time slipped away, their anxiety deepened, knowing Ajin was out there in danger while the authorities refused to act. In one emotional interview, Ajin's brother shared his heart act, expressing how the police's inaction cost them valuable time that could have saved his sister. So each minute that passed without progress felt like a lost chance, pushing the family further into hopelessness. So meanwhile, the killer continued his horrifying acts without any fear of being caught. Confident that no one was actively looking for a John, he disposed of her body parts across the city, showing no remorse. As the family waited helplessly for news, their hope of finding her alive slowly faded. When they finally laid Ajahn to rest, it felt like an unfinished goodbye. Her remains were placed in a sealed zinc coffin, a haunting reminder of the brutal way her life was stolen. Each family member wished for just one more moment with her, to feel her kindness and warmth one last time. The pain was made worse by the police's refusal to admit any wrongdoing. Officials insisted they had taken every necessary step promptly, despite the clear delay at the beginning of the investigation. These facts only added to the family's frustration. How could their desperate cries for help have been ignored at such a critical time? The weight of this negligence was not just felt by Ajahn's family, but by her friends as well, who shared the same sense of anger toward a system that had failed them all. As investigators finally began their work, they found themselves overwhelmed by a wave of rumors and gossip that tarnished Ajahn's reputation. These baseless accusations, spread by malicious people, only intensified the family's suffering. The Ajahn her family and friends knew was a kind, joyful young woman, far removed from the hurtful rumors. So each new piece of evidence uncovered only added to the family's grief, making them feel even more isolated in their sorrow. Aijin's death left a mark not only on her loved ones but on the entire community. She was a bright, talented young woman with big dreams of expanding her clothing brand and building a meaningful life. But her life was taken in the most tragic way, exposing deeper societal problems such as police negligence and violence against women. These issues demanded immediate attention as the community was forced to confront the harsh reality of what had happened. While the investigation unfolded, Tarev's behavior continued to shock everyone. Even in custody, he used social media to post provocative updates showing no regret for his actions. One of his disturbing statuses read, Smile at life and it will surely smile back at you. These words, coming from a man who had taken someone's life, enraged AJ's friends and family. How could someone talk about the joy of life after committing such a terrible act? Aijin's brother, in another heartfelt interview, expressed his belief in karma. With conviction in his voice, he said, I believe that no one escapes the consequences of their actions. Sooner or later, justice will catch up with those who do evil. His words carried a powerful message despite the family's pain. They held on to the hope that justice would prevail. Even in their darkest moments, they refused to let go of that small spark of hope. 
The trial of Rockman Baird Terrett became a symbol of the fight for justice, drawing widespread public attention. People were outraged by the brutality of the crime and demanded answers. However, for Ajan's family, no sentence could undo the loss they had suffered. Their beloved daughter and sister was gone, and no amount of punishment could bring her back. The trial raised important questions about moral responsibility and the need to be more vigilant in our interactions with others. Tragedies like this serve as a grim reminder that we must do everything we can to prevent such violence from happening again. So the case also became a call to action, prompting discussions about the importance of protecting women and making society a safer place. Ajin's story touched the hearts of many and encouraged people to reflect on what must be done to stop similar tragedies in the future. So even after Teravrov was sentenced, questions about his motive remained unanswered. It was clear that his crime brought him some kind of twisted satisfaction, but the full extent of his reasoning was never revealed. Ajin's family, meanwhile, found some solace in the fact that justice had been served. Although Teravrov was sentenced to 25 years in prison, the emotional scars left on those who knew and loved A. John would remain forever. Throughout the trial, the family demanded not only justice but also compensation for the emotional damage they had endured. While the court ruled in their favor, awarding 20 million tenge, no amount of money could ever ease the pain of losing someone so dear. It was a small comfort in a sea of grief. Despite the outcome, the loss of Ajin weighed heavily on the hearts of her loved ones. Her friends, family, and community mourned a bright, compassionate soul whose life was cut short far too soon. In the end, Aijan's story is a reminder of the importance of justice and safety. It urges all of us to reflect on how we can make the world a better place, ensuring that no one else has to endure the pain her family went through. Thank you for watching, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. There are many more stories to uncover. Let's work together to make sure every story counts. Stay safe out there. Hi everyone, I'm Sunny, and today we're diving into a heartbreaking and shocking case that rocked New Zealand and touched hearts around the world. We'll be talking about the latest investigation into the murder of Grace Mill Lane, a young British backpacker whose life was brutally cut short in 2018 while she was exploring the beautiful city of Auckland. This story is not just about a crime, but also about the dangers that sometimes lurk in the most unexpected places. Stick with me as we uncover the chilling details of this case and discuss its impact on Grace's family, the community, and beyond. On December 1, 2018, Grace Mill Lane, a 21-year-old British tourist, was enjoying her time exploring Auckland, New Zealand. Having just graduated from the University of Lincoln, she was backpacking through different countries, relishing new experiences. That night, she had a date planned with a man she had met through a dating app, 26-year-old Jesse Shane Kempson. What started as an evening of casual fun would quickly turn into something far more sinister. The pair met in the bustling Sky City precinct of Auckland, a vibrant area filled with restaurants, bars, and the iconic Sky Tower. They were captured on CCTV footage, seemingly having a pleasant evening. The two drank and talked at various establishments, moving from bar to bar. To anyone watching, they seemed like two people getting to know each other, sharing drinks, laughter, and conversation. Grace was captured on camera smiling, relaxed, and in good spirits as they moved through the city. The night deepened, and eventually, after hours of bar hopping, Kempson invited Grace back to his apartment at the Sitter Life Hotel, a decision that would later prove fatal. The apartment was located in the heart of the city, and Grace agreed to go with him, completely unaware of the dark turn her night was about to take. Once inside Kempson's apartment, the atmosphere drastically shifted. The details of what happened in those moments remain murky, but it is known that things soon took a violent turn. Kemp's son would later claim that the two had engaged in consensual rough sex, which tragically resulted in Grace's death. However, the evidence would later suggest a much more premeditated and intentional scenario, as the level of force and the nature of the act left little room for ambiguity. Grace, trusting and unaware, had no reason to suspect that the man she was spending time with would cause her harm. Yet, in the privacy of that apartment, the evening spiraled out of control. The exact moment when things became fatal is hard to pinpoint. But what is certain is that Grace never left that apartment alive. What started as an evening of exploration and excitement ended in unspeakable tragedy within the walls of that room. In the early hours of December 2nd, the life of Grace Mill Lane was cruelly taken. 
The once lively and smiling traveler was now a victim, her fate sealed in that brief window of time. No one could have predicted the horrific outcome of what seemed like an innocent meeting between two strangers. The very place that was supposed to be her refuge, a safe haven after an adventurous night out, became the scene of her murder. The moments leading up to her death are shrouded in both the mundane and the macabre, a night of casual fun that shifted without warning into an act of violence. Grace had unknowingly entered a dangerous situation, one from which she would not escape. The apartment itself, an otherwise ordinary space in a high-rise building, became a dark and tragic scene, one that would soon be the focal point of a murder investigation. But for Grace, in those moments leading up to her death, there was only confusion, fear, and ultimately, loss of life at the hands of a man she barely knew. When police received the report of Grace Millane's disappearance, the case initially seemed like a routine missing person situation. Grace had last been seen on the evening of December 1, 2018, and when she failed to contact her family on her birthday, December 2, her loved ones grew concerned. Her family, who were in constant communication with her throughout her travels, immediately raised the alarm after they received no birthday messages from Grace, which was unusual for her. The New Zealand police quickly launched a missing persons investigation, starting with Grace's known movements in Auckland. Using surveillance footage from the night of December 1st, they retraced her steps, piecing together her whereabouts before her disappearance. The CCTV footage provided crucial insights, showing Grace in the company of a man, later identified as Jesse Shane Kemp's son, throughout that evening. When police arrived at the Life Hotel, where Grace was last seen on the security cameras, they immediately zeroed in on Kemp's son as a person of interest. By then, Grace had been missing for several days, and Kemp's son was the last known person to have seen her alive. He was brought in for questioning on December 6, 2018, and at first, he appeared cooperative. However, his story quickly began to unravel as inconsistencies emerged in his account of the evening. During the initial police interview, Kemp's son claimed that they had parted ways after a night of drinking, implying that Grace had left his apartment of her own accord. However, investigators were already growing suspicious. They had recovered more CCTV footage showing that Grace never left the building after entering Kempson's apartment. This was a critical moment in the investigation. The footage contradicted Kempson's story, raising serious doubts about his version of events. In addition to the video evidence, other clues began to surface. Forensic investigators combed through Kempson's apartment, looking for any signs of foul play. They discovered bloodstains inside the apartment, further cementing their belief that something terrible had happened in that room. With mounting physical evidence pointing to foul play, the police shifted their focus from a missing person case to a potential homicide. Meanwhile, Kempson's behavior in the days following Grace's disappearance also raised red flags. His movements after her death were captured on camera, showing him purchasing cleaning supplies and a large suitcase. This surveillance footage would later play a crucial role in painting a picture of his attempt to cover up the crime. These actions suggested that Kemp's son was not only involved in Grace's disappearance but had actively tried to conceal her death. The growing body of evidence prompted the police to continue pressuring Kemp's son during questioning. Eventually, on December 8, 2018, the investigation took a decisive turn when Kemp's son was formally charged with Grace Millane's murder. Police had already recovered a suitcase containing Grace's body, which was found in a shallow grave in a forested area outside Auckland. The chilling discovery confirmed their worst fears. Grace had been murdered, and Kemp's son was the prime suspect. The investigation now had a clear direction. The police had gathered a wealth of physical and digital evidence, including Kempson's internet search history, which further implicated him in Grace's death. The clues pointed not only to premeditation but also to a cold and calculated effort to dispose of her body. The police investigation, which started with the goal of finding a missing tourist, quickly transformed into a full-scale homicide inquiry. The efficient and thorough work of the New Zealand police ensured that the pieces of the puzzle fell into place, leading to the arrest and eventual conviction of Jesse Kemp's son for Grace Millane's murder. The investigation exposed the brutal reality of what had transpired in Kempson's apartment that fateful night, bringing justice to Grace's family and friends, though it could never truly undo the pain of their loss. When it came to the murder of Grace Millane, one of the central questions was, why did Jesse Shane Kempson commit such a heinous crime? 
While many details of the case emerged during the investigation and trial, the true motive behind Kempson's actions remained a point of deep speculation and analysis. Kemp's son, 26 years old at the time, was not an obvious suspect in the beginning. He appeared to be a regular young man living in Auckland, but further investigation revealed a darker side to his character. Kemp's son had a history of troubling behaviors that suggested a pattern of manipulation, dishonesty, and violence. These tendencies would come to light as investigators delved deeper into his past. Determining a clear motive for Grace Millane's murder was challenging. Initially, Kemp's son tried to claim that her death was an accident that occurred during consensual rough sex, a defense that he maintained throughout the trial. He argued that it was an unfortunate incident, not a premeditated act of violence. However, the evidence contradicted his version of events. What became apparent during the investigation was Kempson's pangshan for control and manipulation, particularly in his interactions with women. Text messages and online activity showed that he frequently sought out casual relationships and had a disturbing fascination with violent sexual practices. His internet search history, discovered after Grace's death, revealed that he had searched for information about pornography and methods for body disposal in the hours immediately following the murder. This evidence painted a picture of a man who was not only comfortable with violence but had an eerie level of preparation for dealing with the aftermath. Kempson's actions after Grace's death also suggested a lack of remorse or panic. Instead of contacting authorities or seeking help, he calmly went about cleaning the crime scene and purchasing items, such as a suitcase, to hide the body. These behaviors indicated that Kempson's mindset was not one of regret, but one focused on self-preservation and covering up the crime. While the exact psychological or emotional triggers for the murder remain unclear, Experts suggested that Kempson's motive may have been rooted in a need for power and domination. His past interactions with women, combined with the calculated manner in which he tried to conceal Grace's death, pointed to a pattern of dangerous and predatory behavior. From the moment Grace was reported missing, the police worked quickly to establish a timeline of events and identify potential suspects. Given that Grace was a tourist with no known connections to criminal activity or local residents in New Zealand, Suspicion naturally fell on those who had been in contact with her during her final hours. Jesse Shane Kemp's son became the primary suspect almost immediately. Surveillance footage placed him as the last person seen with Grace, and his actions after her disappearance raised serious concerns. During questioning, Kemp's son initially tried to distance himself from the case, claiming that Grace had left his apartment and that he had no idea where she went afterward. However, inconsistencies in his story along with growing physical evidence, quickly unraveled this defense. The police's focus on Kemp's son as the main suspect was further supported by his suspicious behavior after Grace's death. CCTV footage captured him calmly purchasing cleaning products and a suitcase in the days following her disappearance, while his internet search history revealed that he had looked up ways to dispose of a body. These damning clues left little doubt about his involvement. While Kemp's son was the only person charged with Grace's murder, the investigation revealed that he had a troubling history with other women. During the trial, it came to light that he had been involved in other violent and abusive relationships, further solidifying the case against him. His predatory behavior, though not widely known before the murder, came to the forefront during the trial, exposing him as a man with a pattern of deceit, control, and violence. In conclusion, although Kemp's son attempted to portray the murder as an accidental death during consensual activity, the overwhelming evidence pointed to a much darker and more deliberate motive. His history, the calculated way in which he handled the crime scene, and the disturbing online searches all painted a picture of a man who had likely been leading up to this moment for some time. In the end, the motive behind Grace's murder appeared to stem from a dangerous mix of control, violence, and a lack of empathy, making Jesse Shane Kemp's son the clear and sole suspect in the case. Following the disappearance of Grace Mill Lane, the New Zealand police moved swiftly to gather evidence and identify potential suspects. As the investigation unfolded, Jesse Shane Kemp's son quickly became the prime suspect due to his presence with Grace on the night she was last seen. The arrest of Kemp's son, however, was not without its complexities, as his behavior and attempts to cover his tracks raised suspicions that others might have been involved or complicit in the crime. However, despite early concerns, it was soon established that Kemp's son acted alone, without any accomplices. On December 8, 2018, after days of mounting evidence against him, 
Jesse Kemp's son was formally arrested and charged with the murder of Grace Mill Lane. His arrest followed an intensive investigation in which the police had carefully pieced together his movements, gathered forensic evidence from his apartment, and discovered his attempts to dispose of Grace's body. Once Kemp's son was identified as the last person to be seen with Grace, the police began to scrutinize his activities in the days following her disappearance. Surveillance footage played a key role in this process. It showed Kemp's son calmly leaving his apartment in the Sitter Life Hotel multiple times after Grace's death, purchasing cleaning supplies and a large suitcase that he would later use to transport her body. The footage, along with forensic evidence found in his apartment, gave the police enough grounds to detain him for questioning. During his initial police interview, Kemp's son repeatedly changed his story. At first, he claimed that Grace had left his apartment alive. But when confronted with the evidence, including the fact that Grace was never seen leaving the building, he shifted his narrative. He then alleged that her death was an accident, the result of consensual rough sex gone wrong. This explanation, however, did not align with the forensic evidence, which suggested that Grace had been strangled with deliberate force. Kempson's arrest was a turning point in the case. The police had gathered enough physical evidence to charge him, and he was taken into custody while investigators continued to build their case. Although his arrest did not immediately end the investigation, it allowed the police to focus their efforts on proving his involvement beyond a reasonable doubt. Initially, there were questions as to whether Kemp's son had acted alone or if others had helped him in his attempts to cover up the crime. The methodical nature of his actions, such as cleaning the crime scene, disposing of the body, and maintaining a calm demeanor in public, raised suspicions that he may have had assistance. However, as the investigation progressed, the police found no concrete evidence to suggest that anyone else was involved in Grace's murder or the subsequent cover-up. Kempson's use of technology, such as his internet searches on how to dispose of a body and his attempts to mislead investigators, indicated that he had planned and carried out the crime on his own. His behavior after the murder, while calculated, appeared to be the work of a lone individual trying to avoid detection. The police thoroughly examined his communications, social media, and personal interactions but found no links to any accomplices. As the investigation continued, it became clear that Kemp's son had acted entirely on his own. No other individuals were charged in connection with the crime, and the focus remained solely on Kempson's actions. His arrest marked the beginning of a lengthy legal process that would eventually bring him to trial. Following his arrest, Kemp's son was charged with murder and held in custody while awaiting trial. The New Zealand justice system moved swiftly, and the case garnered significant media attention, both locally and internationally. The trial would become a high-profile case, as the public sought answers and justice for Grace Mill Lane. Kempson's defense was that Grace's death had been accidental, a tragic outcome of consensual rough sex. However, the prosecution argued that the evidence showed clear intent and premeditation. The details of the case, including Kempson's disturbing internet search history, his actions after Grace's death, and the forensic findings, all pointed to a deliberate act of violence. The murder of Grace Mill Lane left a deep and lasting impact not only on her family and friends, but also on the wider community in both New Zealand and the United Kingdom. The tragic nature of her death resonated with people around the world, sparking conversations about safety, violence against women, and the vulnerabilities faced by young travelers. The aftermath of Grace's murder brought with it profound grief, heartache, and a push for societal reflection. Grace Millane's family, who had supported her adventurous spirit and cheered her on as she traveled the world, were left utterly devastated by the news of her murder. For them, Grace was not only a daughter and a sister but a source of joy and pride. She had just graduated from university, full of dreams for her future, when her life was tragically cut short. The impact of her death was immediate and overwhelming for her parents, David and Gillian Mill Lane. Upon learning that Grace had gone missing in New Zealand, they quickly traveled from the UK to Auckland, hoping against hope for her safe return. When their worst fears were confirmed, they were thrust into the spotlight as they grieved publicly, surrounded by media and a global audience. David Mill Lane, in particular, became a prominent figure in the news as he emotionally addressed the press, describing his daughter as a lovely, outgoing, fun-loving, family-orientated daughter. For the Mill Lane family, the tragedy of Grace's death didn't end with the arrest of Jesse Kemp's son. The pain was compounded by the legal proceedings, the trial, and the graphic details that emerged about Grace's final moments. 
Every new revelation brought with it fresh waves of grief. Even after Kempson's conviction, the family has spoken of the emptiness and devastation that they continue to feel. Grace's absence left a permanent hole in their lives, one that no verdict or sentence could ever fill. The Mill Lane family also became the face of global grief, as their story resonated with people everywhere. In the years following Grace's death, they worked to honor her memory, establishing the Love Grace charity in her name. The charity helps provide backpacks to victims of domestic violence, a fitting tribute to Grace, who had loved travel and adventure. Through this work, her family found a way to transform their grief into something that could help others, ensuring that Grace's legacy would be one of kindness and support for those in need. Grace Millane's murder deeply affected the community in New Zealand, a country known for its beauty, safety, and friendly hospitality. The tragedy shook the nation to its core, particularly as it was a reminder that no place is immune to violence, even one as seemingly safe as New Zealand. Auckland, the city where Grace was killed, was especially impacted. Locals felt a sense of collective sorrow and responsibility, as though a crime like this shouldn't have happened in their country. In the days following Grace's death, vigils were held across New Zealand to honor her memory and express support for her family. These gatherings were somber but powerful, with people from all walks of life coming together to mourn a life lost too soon. Many felt a deep sense of empathy, as Grace's story could have easily been that of their own daughters, sisters, or friends. The outpouring of public grief reflected the collective shock and sorrow that the New Zealand community felt for a visitor who had come to their country in search of adventure but met with violence instead. The murder also prompted national discussions about the safety of women, particularly those who travel alone. New Zealand, like many other countries, began reflecting on the need to address gender-based violence more openly and proactively. Grace's death became a symbol for the vulnerability of women and the need for greater societal change to protect them. Beyond New Zealand, Grace Millane's murder reverberated around the world, particularly in her home country, the United Kingdom. The case was extensively covered by the international media, and people from across the globe expressed their outrage, sorrow, and solidarity with Grace's family. The global reaction to her death highlighted the widespread fear and concern about violence against women, a topic that transcended national borders. Women around the world shared their own experiences of feeling unsafe, especially while traveling, and discussions about how to address these issues became more prevalent. Grace's story became a cautionary tale for many, with calls for better protections for solo travelers, more awareness around dating safety, and stronger conversations around consent. Her murder, while tragic, ignited a larger movement toward addressing these societal issues. The aftermath of Grace Millane's murder has left a lasting mark on her family, the community in New Zealand, and the global public. While Jesse Shane Kemp's son was brought to justice for his heinous crime, the pain of Grace's death lingers. Her family continues to carry the weight of their loss, and the community in New Zealand remains forever changed by the tragic events of December 2018. Through the efforts of her family, friends, and supporters, Grace's legacy lies on. Her story serves as a reminder of the need for continued awareness, protection, and action against violence, particularly violence against women. Though her life was tragically cut short, Grace Millane's memory continues to inspire change, calling on the world to make it safer for all. The murder of Grace Mill Lane is a heartbreaking reminder of the dangers that exist even in places where safety is assumed. Her death, at the hands of a man she met while seeking adventure in a faraway land, sparked international sorrow and highlighted the vulnerabilities women often face. What began as a celebration of her young life and newfound freedom ended in tragedy. But Grace's story has left a profound and lasting impact on the world. For her family, the loss is immeasurable. They continue to mourn the vibrant, loving woman whose life was stolen far too soon. Their pain has been felt across the globe. And through their strength and determination, they've worked to ensure that Grace's legacy becomes one of hope and support for victims of violence. Grace Millane's memory lies on in their efforts to create positive change in the world. And through their work, her life continues to inspire others. In New Zealand, the tragic event led to national reflection on safety, the vulnerability of travelers, and the pervasive issue of violence against women. Grace's death became a catalyst for conversations that urgently needed to be had in New Zealand and beyond. 
The story of her life and death now serves as both a cautionary tale and a call to action. While justice was served with the conviction of Jesse Shane Kemp's son, it could never undo the pain or bring back the life that was lost. Grace Millane's murder reminds us that, as a society, we must continue to fight against violence and ensure that everyone, no matter where they are in the world, can feel safe. In the end, Grace's story is not just one of loss but also of resilience, love, and the collective need for compassion and action. Her memory endures, not only in the hearts of those who loved her but in the global movement to create a world where such tragedies no longer happen. It was a seemingly normal morning on December 11, 2023. The city of Las Vegas, known for its bright lights and endless entertainment, was just waking up. But for one man, the day was about to become a living nightmare. He hadn't heard from his brother, Marvin Patterson, for a few days and something felt off. Hoping everything was fine, he decided to stop by and check in. But when he knocked on the door and got no answer, his heart began to race. Nothing could have prepared him for what he was about to see. So inside, he found a scene of unimaginable horror. Blood on the walls, silence so loud it screamed at him. And there, lying on the floor and in bed, were five members of the same family, his brother, Marvin, Marvin's wife, Shannara Patterson, and their three children, aged 6 to 14. In shock, he could barely speak, but he managed to tell the 911 operator what he had found. They're all dead, he stammered, but wait, one of them is still breathing. I need an ambulance. My nephews, they've been shot, but one is still breathing. Please hurry. When the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police arrived, they confirmed the worst. A mother, her three children, and her husband, all shot, all bloody. Four of them already gone. But what had led to this horrific scene? How could a family's life be torn apart so brutally in one night? As the investigation unfolded, the shocking truth behind these murders would send shockwaves through the entire community. By the way, I post true crime and strange cases here every day, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. Before the tragic events of December 11, 2023, Shannara Patterson was a vibrant, loving mother of three, living what seemed like a fulfilling life with her husband, Marvin Patterson, in Las Vegas, Nevada. To the outside world, they looked like the perfect family, but behind closed doors, things were much more complicated. Born on December 10, 1989, in Long Beach, California, Shinara, or Nera as her friends and family affectionately called her, was known for her kind and caring nature. So 34 years old, she was a devoted mother, a talented cosmetologist, and a beloved friend to many. People who knew her would describe her as hardworking, compassionate, and always willing to lend a helping hand. Shinara had three beautiful children, 14-year-old Keziah, 11-year-old Derek Jr., also known as DJ, and 6-year-old Zamira. Each child had their own unique personality, but they all shared one thing, their mother's warmth and kindness. Kaisire, or Zia as she was called, was creative and loved to draw. DJ was a playful boy who adored his mother, and Zamira, the youngest, was full of energy and sweetness, often called duty by her family. Janara's life wasn't without its challenges, though. She had two children, Kazia and DJ, from a previous relationship before meeting Marvin Patterson. Despite this, Marvin stepped in and embraced his role as a stepfather. Their blended family seemed to function smoothly and from the outside they appeared to be happy. In May 2019, Shannara and Marvin tied the knot in a beautiful Las Vegas wedding. It was a day filled with love and hope for the future. Shannara believed she had finally found someone who would stand by her side and she was eager to build a life together with Marvin. On their wedding website, she even wrote about how grateful she was to have found someone who appreciated and loved her. To their friends and family, Shannara and Marvin's marriage seemed picture-perfect. They were often seen together, whether attending family gatherings, making fun TikTok videos, or simply enjoying life with their kids. They presented themselves as a happy, loving couple, and for a time, that seemed to be true. But behind the smiles and the happy appearances, things were far from perfect. While Shannara was thriving in her career as a cosmetologist, working with clients who loved her for her skills in hair care and styling, Marvin's life was becoming more and more unstable. Their family life, which once seemed so strong, was beginning to crumble. Shannara worked hard to support her family. She was a talented entrepreneur with a growing clientele, known for her exceptional skill in braiding and styling hair. 
Her clients admired her work, and she always made sure her children looked their best whether they were at school or at home. Her children adored her, and Shanira poured all her love and energy into giving them a good life. From their clothes to their hairstyles, she made sure they were always well taken care of. But as Marvin's struggles with his own personal demons grew more intense, Shanara found herself facing challenges she could never have anticipated. As we'll soon learn, the cracks in Marvin's fisasca would eventually shatter the illusion of their perfect family, and the true darkness lurking beneath the surface would come to light in the most horrific way imaginable. From the outside looking in, Shannara and Marvin Patterson's relationship seemed like a love story filled with hope, devotion, and happiness. They had built what many people thought was a perfect blended family. But as with many relationships, the cracks beneath the surface would soon widen into something far more destructive. Shannara met Marvin in the bustling city of Las Vegas, where both had their roots planted and their families to care for. Shannara, a young mother of two from a previous relationship, was looking for stability, someone to stand by her side and help raise her children. Marvin seemed like that man. He was a father himself, and they quickly bonded over their shared experiences of family life. At first, Marvin appeared to be the perfect partner and stepfather. He embraced Kazaya and DJ as his own, forming what appeared to be a strong family unit. The couple seemed inseparable. They enjoyed family outings, shared moments on social media, and appeared to be living the American dream. It wasn't long before Marvin and Shannara decided to tie the knot. In May 2019, Shannara and Marvin made their love official with a beautiful Las Vegas wedding. Surrounded by friends and family, they vowed to spend their lives together. Shannara, overwhelmed with love and joy, described Marvin as the man she had prayed for, someone who appreciated her and her children. She believed in him deeply. A year after their wedding, they welcomed their own child, a daughter named Zamira, making their family a unit of five. So by all accounts, this was a happy time for them. Shannara often posted pictures of her beautiful family sharing her moments of joy. But beneath the surface, things were not as perfect as they seemed. Despite the loving image Marvin projected to the outside world, the family dynamics were far more complicated. Marvin had come into the relationship with his own set of personal struggles. He had been through a divorce just one month before marrying Shannara, and while it seemed like he was committed to building a new life with her, things soon took a dark turn. As the months passed, cracks began to form in their relationship. Marvin's past, which had remained hidden for a long time, slowly started to come to light. By October 2022, Marvin was arrested for a series of disturbing crimes involving minors. Charges of lewd acts, assault, and even kidnapping emerged, painting a much darker picture of the man Shannara had fallen in love with. But for Shannara, this was a devastating blow. The man she thought she knew, the man she had built a life with, was now facing accusations of unspeakable acts. Yet despite these serious allegations, there were no signs that she had planned to leave him. Shannara stood by Marvin's side, believing in his innocence, or perhaps hoping for the best. Marvin, out on bail after his arrest, was placed under house arrest. He was forbidden from being around children under 18 yet, somehow he was still able to live near his family. Shannara, wanting to keep her family together, continued to believe that Marvin could be the man she fell in love with, so, but it would be a decision that would ultimately have devastating consequences. So the strain of Marvin's legal troubles, the financial pressures, and the emotional toll on their relationship were becoming too much to bear. What had once been a loving family was now cracking under the weight of these pressures. And in the weeks leading up to the tragedy, no one could have predicted just how far Marvin would fall or how much he would take down with him. From the outside looking in, Shannara and Marvin Patterson's relationship seemed like a love story filled with hope, devotion, and happiness. They had built what many people thought was a perfect blended family. But as with many relationships, the cracks beneath the surface would soon widen into something far more destructive. Shannara met Marvin in the bustling city of Las Vegas, where both had their roots planted and their families to care for. Shannara, a young mother of two from a previous relationship, was looking for stability, someone to stand by her side and help raise her children. Marvin seemed like that man. He was a father himself, and they quickly bonded over their shared experiences of family life. At first, Marvin appeared to be the perfect partner and stepfather. He embraced Kazaya and DJ as his own, forming what appeared to be a strong family unit. The couple seemed inseparable. They enjoyed family outings, shared moments on social media, and appeared to be living the American dream. It wasn't long before Marvin and Shanara decided to tie the knot. In May 2019, Shanara and Marvin 
made their love official with a beautiful Las Vegas wedding. Surrounded by friends and family, they vowed to spend their lives together. Shannara, overwhelmed with love and joy, described Marvin as the man she had prayed for, someone who appreciated her and her children. She believed in him deeply. A year after their wedding, they welcomed their own child, a daughter named Zamira, making their family a unit of five. By all accounts, this was a happy time for them. Shinara often posted pictures of her beautiful family sharing their moments of joy. So, but beneath the surface, things were not as perfect as they seemed. Despite the loving image Marvin projected to the outside world, the family dynamics were far more complicated. Marvin had come into the relationship with his own set of personal struggles. He had been through a divorce just one month before marrying Shinara, and while it seemed like he was committed to building a new life with her, things soon took a dark turn. As the months passed, cracks began to form in their relationship. Marvin's past, which had remained hidden for a long time, slowly started to come to light. By October 2022, Marvin was arrested for a series of disturbing crimes involving minors. Charges of lewd acts, assault, and even kidnapping emerged, painting a much darker picture of the man Shannara had fallen in love with. But for Shannara, this was a devastating blow. The man she thought she knew, the man she had built a life with, was now facing accusations of unspeakable acts. Yet, despite these serious allegations, there were no signs that she had planned to leave him. Shannara stood by Marvin's side, believing in his innocence, or perhaps hoping for the best. Marvin, out on bail after his arrest, was placed under house arrest. He was forbidden from being around children under 18 yet. Somehow, he was still able to live near his family. Shannara, wanting to keep her family together, continued to believe that Marvin could be the man she fell in love with but it would be a decision that would ultimately have devastating consequences. The strain of Marvin's legal troubles, the financial pressures, and the emotional toll on their relationship were becoming too much to bear. What had once been a loving family was now cracking under the weight of these pressures. And in the weeks leading up to the tragedy, no one could have predicted just how far Marvin would fall, or how much he would take down with him. In the next chapter of this story, we will uncover the terrifying events that unfolded on that fateful night when Marvin Patterson made a decision that would shatter the lives of those close to him. December 11, 2023, began like any other morning in Las Vegas, but by the end of that day, a tragic and horrifying crime would leave a family destroyed and a community in shock. But what looked like an ordinary family from the outside was about to become the center of a nightmare. Marvin Patterson had been struggling for months. After being released on bail for serious child-related charges, he found himself under constant stress. His financial situation was crumbling, and he faced eviction and the repossession of his car. The weight of these pressures and the looming legal battle seemed to push him to a breaking point. On the night of December 10, just one day after Shannara celebrated her 34th birthday, Marvin's frustrations boiled over. A text message to his brother that evening gave a haunting glimpse into his state of mind, I can't do this anymore. What followed would be a devastating act of violence that no one could have anticipated. Marvin's brother, Jason, decided to check in on him the next morning. When he arrived at the apartment, the silence inside was deafening. He knocked on the door, no response. With growing panic, Jason forced the door open. What he found inside would haunt him forever. Side, Jason discovered the unimaginable. His brother, Marvin, had shot and killed his wife, Shannara, their three children, and then himself. So the scene was horrifying. Blood covered the room, and the silence was overwhelming. But in the midst of the carnage, there was one faint glimmer of hope. DJ, the 11-year-old boy, was still breathing. Please, I need an ambulance. I think my nephew is still breathing. I don't know how, but he's alive. Shanara, Kazia, and Zamira were pronounced dead at the scene. Marvin had shot them in cold blood before turning the gun on himself. But by some miracle, DJ was clinging to life. He was rushed to the hospital, where doctors fought to save him, though the trauma, both physical and emotional, was immense. The aftermath of the crime sent shockwaves through the Las Vegas community. How could this have happened? Why wasn't Marvin kept in jail? These were questions that haunted everyone who knew the family. As news of the tragedy spread, friends, family, and neighbors gathered to mourn the loss of Shannara and her children. So they remembered her as a loving mother full of life and kindness, who only wanted the best for her kids. Kazaya, the artistic and funny 14-year-old. Zamira, the sweet and energetic 6-year-old. And DJ, the boy who had somehow survived this unthinkable act of violence. I can't understand how this happened. My daughter was full of love, full of life, and now she's gone, all because of him. The tragedy raised many questions, not just about Marvin's mental state, but also about the legal system. Should he have been released on such a low bail considering the charges against him? Could this have been prevented? 
Many believe that this senseless crime could have been avoided if Marvin hadn't been released from jail. Activists and community members demanded accountability, questioning why such a dangerous man was allowed to return home to his family. In the end, nothing can bring back Shanera and her children. Their lives were cut short by a man who was supposed to protect them. And while DJ survived, he faces a long road of recovery both physically and emotionally. So this tragedy serves as a heartbreaking reminder of the darkness that can hide behind closed doors and the unimaginable consequences of ignoring the signs. The tragic deaths of Shanara Patterson and her children sent shockwaves through the Las Vegas community. Neighbors, friends, and even strangers struggled to come to terms with the devastating loss of a family that had once appeared so full of life. In the wake of this horrifying crime, grief took over the community like a dark cloud, touching everyone who heard the story. Shanara was remembered by those who knew her as a loving mother, a devoted friend, and a talented cosmetologist. Her children, Kazia, DJ, and Zamir were cherished by their classmates and neighbors. Kazaya, at just 14 years old, was already known for her artistic talents and funny personality. DJ, only 11, had survived the unimaginable, but his life would be forever changed. And little Zamira, sweet and full of energy at six, was the light of the family. I never thought I would have to bury my daughter my grandchildren. This isn't the way things are supposed to be. They were taken from us too soon, and we will never be the same. As the days passed, the community came together to support Shannara's family. A vigil was held in their honor, drawing people from all walks of life who were touched by the tragedy. Many couldn't help but ask the same question, could this have been prevented? If Marvin had remained in jail, would this family still be alive today? The funeral for Shannara and her daughters was a heartbreaking event. Held at a Las Vegas chapel, the service was filled with emotional tributes from friends and family. Tears flowed freely as loved ones shared stories of Shannara's kindness and her dedication to her children. The community's grief was palpable as many struggled to comprehend the senseless nature of the tragedy. Through Shannara's mother, James Etta, the pain was indescribable. Having already lost her husband years earlier, she was now left with the unimaginable task of burying her daughter and two granddaughters. A part of me died with them, she said in her tearful eulogy. I don't know how I'll ever move on. Despite the overwhelming sadness, the community rallied to support DJ, the only survivor of the massacre. Fundraisers were organized to help cover his medical expenses and the therapy he would need to recover, both physically and emotionally. While no amount of money could heal the deep scars left by this tragedy, the community's outpouring of support gave DJ and his surviving family members a glimmer of hope in their darkest hour. The tragedy of Shannara Patterson and her family will forever be etched in the hearts of those who knew them. While the emotional scars may never fully heal, the community's strength and compassion serve as a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable loss, people can come together to lift one another up. Against all odds, 11-year-old DJ survived the unimaginable. In the aftermath of the brutal crime that claimed the lives of his mother, sisters, and father, DJ was the lone survivor, clinging to life by the thinnest thread. Rushed to the hospital in critical condition, his survival became a small miracle amid an overwhelming tragedy. Doctors at the University Medical Center of Las Vegas worked tirelessly to save DJ. The injuries he sustained were severe, both physically and emotionally. But after weeks of surgeries and intense medical care, DJ pulled through. While his physical wounds would eventually heal, the emotional scars from that night would remain forever. For DJ's grandmother, James Seta, seeing her grandson survive was a bittersweet blessing. She had lost her daughter and two granddaughters in the blink of an eye, but DJ was still with her alive. So it was the last piece of her shattered family. He's my miracle, she said quietly. But every day, I'm reminded of what we lost. DJ's road to recovery would be long and filled with challenges. The physical trauma was only part of his battle. The emotional and psychological impact of witnessing the death of his family was far more difficult to heal. His therapy sessions became a regular part of his life as he struggled to process the unimaginable grief and trauma he had endured. With the support of his grandmother and extended family, DJ slowly began to rebuild his life. Therapy became an essential part of his healing process, helping him navigate the overwhelming emotions that came with surviving such a horrific event. His grandmother, James Seta, dedicated herself to ensuring that DJ had every resource available to help him heal. Although DJ is alive, the emotional weight of his survival is something he will carry with him for the rest of his life. 
Each day is a reminder of the family he lost and the tragedy he witnessed, but his survival is also a testament to his resilience a symbol of hope that, even in the face of unspeakable horror, the human spirit can endure. While DJ's journey to recovery is far from over, the love and support of his family and community offer a beacon of hope in his darkest days. His survival reminds us that even in the most tragic circumstances, there is still the possibility of healing, of finding strength, and of continuing on. For DJ and his family, the path forward is uncertain, but they will walk it together one step at a time. As we reflect on the devastating events that unfolded on December 11, 2023, one question lingers in the minds of everyone touched by this tragedy. Could it have been prevented? Was there something, anything that could have been done to stop Marvin Patterson before he took the lives of his wife, children, and ultimately himself? Marvin had been arrested in October 2022 on serious charges involving offenses against children, charges that should have raised every red flag. Yet, after spending just two months in jail, his bail was reduced from $100,000 to $10,000, allowing him to return to his family. A man who was accused of such serious crimes was released back into the very environment where the unthinkable would soon happen. For many, this decision is hard to understand. Should a man facing such grave accusations have been granted bail at all? And even with bail, should it have been lowered to an amount that allowed him to return home? So Marvin's release raises critical questions about the justice system's role in protecting not only the accused's rights but also the safety of potential victims. Shannara's mother, Jamisetta, and many others close to the family believe that Marvin should have remained behind bars. So they argue that if his bail had not been reduced, Shannara and her children might still be alive today? Could the system have done more to protect them? But the deeper issues extend beyond just one case. Marvin's release is part of a larger conversation about how the legal system handles cases involving accusations of child abuse, domestic violence, and other serious crimes. When the system fails to protect the most vulnerable, tragedies like this become all too possible. As the community mourns, they are left with more questions than answers. What could have been done differently? What lessons can be learned from this heartbreaking event? And how can we, as a society, ensure that we don't allow another family to fall through the cracks of a broken system? In the end, nothing can bring back Shannara and her children. But their story serves as a reminder of the importance of vigilance, of asking the hard questions, and of seeking justice not just for the living, but for those who are no longer with us. Could this tragedy have been avoided? We may never know the full answer, but we owe it to those lost to keep asking and to demand better. Thank you for watching. And if you found this story moving, please consider sharing it to raise awareness about the issues that contributed to this tragedy. Together we can work toward a safer and more just world.